thank you for the invitation to be part of the presentation today. Um, uh, as Hayley mentioned, we're going to be talking about a different side of catchment management um, in, in looking at how we take on different challenges, multiple challenges, and really look at embedding the, as say, public, the landowners, all the different stakeholders within our work that's going to go ahead for the next five years. This is called Smarter Water Catchments. Um, there we are. And today, this is what I'm going to be speaking about. I'm the project manager for the Smart Water Catchments Initiative. Uh, and I'll take you through today sort of how this is a new and innovative approach, um, the rationale for why we're doing this, and also the methodology of what we're employing and how we're employing it across three very different catchment areas. Um, the challenges and opportunities does this will give us, as well as the wider partnership approach, and the multiple benefits that we're hoping to glean from this as well. Um, Hayley, please do let me know if I'm overrunning, if we get to sort of 10, 15 minutes, please just give me a signal of some sort. Um, so what we've uh, looked at so far in AMP6, so AMP6 was um, during the 2015 to 2020, was perhaps focusing on one particular parameter. So in this case, it was uh, metaldehyde that we looked at in the even load, for example. Um, as part of AMP7, which is 2020 to 2025, our operating cycles, our funding cycles, um, we thought we really want to address some of the things that we're seeing and we need to work better on. Um, and seeing things as a system rather than focusing in on one specific parameter or issue in the catchment. And we understand that the catchment um, has many challenges in terms of water quality, but also what affects that water quality um, and how we need to work together with all the different aspects and facets uh, within the catchment to understand its value and also the contributions that each of us play to that. Um, Thames is very committed to really struggling <laughs> with some of these issues, but very committed to making sure that we can improve the environment or we can improve our performance and how we work with others in that catchment as well. But there's no way that we could do this by ourselves. We really need the valued understanding and partnership and evidence, um, and I suppose the specialisms that come with those that work and live locally and are specialists in these different fields. So the idea was to actually form these different um, approaches with the strength of these partnerships um, created within each uh, catchment and really to understand that, yes, these are specialists which have their own particular reason for wanting to improve the environment. But also we want to understand from a public value point of view, what value does this give to the public in a wider sense, in the social, economic and environmental sense, and really how we capture those environmental and social and economic benefits uh, capturing them across the whole and how we track that evidence that will also help us to inform how we shape and invest in our business. Um, it's a really critical part, obviously. It's not just about the you know, pipes and pumps and cement and doing um, major changes in that kind of sense, but it's actually how can we start thinking more about the future? And this approach and this initiative will help inform the whole business on how we do our future ways of working. So how we uh, established this was it, take, it took a while uh, to get everybody together to understand what were the key objectives that we wanted to see. And the things that we really recognized is that um, this is a me mechanism of co-delivery, of innovation, of a particular way to actually structure our work across a five or 10 year period that gives us the opportunity to do things and try things incrementally but with a very clear vision to wanting to make sure that the environmental challenges we face can be improved and do this collectively together. And this is obviously a systems thinking approach that perhaps others have used uh, as well. Um, and we want to strengthen the CABA partnerships as they're developing in themselves. And in order to do this, so we want to try and make sure that the benefits, as I mentioned, not only improve the water quality of the in rivers, but actually look at everything from the source to to wherever the, the sea, sorry, not the sea, but whether the river meets with the other catchments um, and make sure that those that are participating and utilizing this for commercial, for um, recreational purposes, do things responsibly as well. And we can work to improve that too. This is, I say, um, an off what um, commitment. So the performance commitment that we have to uh, report against on an annual basis against the plans that we put in place. Uh, and these plans were developed alongside with our partners. This wasn't something that Thames did in, in, in its entirety by itself. Um, and so we have the finances to support this AMP period until 2025, 
but a commitment until uh, for the full 10 year period to do this. So looking at where these locations are, three very distinct uh, locations, uh, starting with uh, South, sorry, North Oxfordshire in the Evenlode, uh, a very rural catchment compared to the River Chess, which has a mixture of largely rural, but mixing into urban, going in from Chesham to Rickmansworth, um, and then comparing to the River Crane, which is a very uh, urbanized West London river with lots of tributaries, um, anything starting from uh, Hounslow, sort of ter Terminal 5-ish of, um, of the Heathrow and going all the way down to Mogden, where our sewage works is all kind of Twickenham area. So we recognize that actually um, the river source is extremely different. Um, each of these is uh, needs to be highly protected. Um, the river chest is a chalk stream and therefore uh, has three separate springs that feed it and is very dependent on um, the natural water cycle, but also abstraction and other issues as well. We have 3 million invested in these three catchments for the next five years, which will allow us to do, as I mentioned, a lot of trialing, uh, evidence gathering uh, to inform us of how we go, go forward. So as what we hope to achieve, um, as this diagram, I'm sure you've seen many similar ones before, um, is looking at all the different multiple challenges and stakeholders involved here. Um, and we really want to uh, strengthen how we collect the information um, and being able to put that together to maximize our opportunities um, through not sometimes co-financing, uh, sometimes doing direct financing of this. There's so many different funding initiatives going on of different durations. Um, we've got uh, the Grace and the DEFRA funding, uh, we've got ELMS, we've got FIPL coming in, we've got so many different things, GLA. So we really need to be uh, quite smart as a collective to see where's the best uh, place to apportion this money, where do certain other grants uh, have a bespoke or specific interest that we can complement uh, where they are limited to, and really making sure that um, we can kind of look at the wider picture when we do this. The three catchments were officially launched in April this year, and they can be found on the website there just where you can see. Um, and there are plans uh, spanning the next 10 years with specific deliverable actions on a year on year each year that we can find there. So how is this different from perhaps other approaches? Um, we've committed to, to getting this right, to getting this approach right, we really need to have full data sharing and transparency. There's a wealth of data that exists, um, but it's very scattered. So a lot of the time has been to work with other organizations to pull the information together um, to encourage others to also data share transparently um, and to really try and make sense of whether the parameters really speak to each other properly. Um, and actually, can we compare like for like or are we having difficulties comparing like for like? Um, and actually trying to see sort of what parameters we need to be looking forward uh, to monitoring into the future. So this is the quantitative and qualitative parameters. Uh, the way that the decisions were made is not that we made a plan and gave it to the catchment group and said, would you like to sign off on this? But it was a series over about 18 months of several workshops, um, several discussions, prioritization streams, um, and really looking at if a strategy existed in the existing catchment, what are the key themes that they want to focus in on and how can we expand and, and help to do that? Um, and also how we can help to strengthen the capacity of the hosting organizations and those that are contributing. So this was a definitely a, a collective effort. And the same goes for when we are signing off any uh, investment or any project, um, this is sent around the steering group and we are shoulder to shoulder with the rest of the partners. We don't take any particular higher precedence over them. Um, and the chair actually is the catchment host. So this is where um, we are looking at now. The challenge, I suppose, has been to tick all these boxes underneath here, because um, essentially, if we want to do uh, a very open and transparent way of working, we have to gain trust. And the challenge is, is that um, clearly there's been incidences that have happened from pollution to others where trust has been eroded. And we really want to make sure that going forward, um, we can be a trusted organization um, and we need to prove this. And so a case a lot of the time has been to prove 
that we are able to provide what's requested, that we're on time with the information, the resources and everything else that goes in hand and committed to being there to support as well. So I'm one of uh, just two people, but there's myself and Rosie Nelson who are dedicated specifically to this project um, and really making sure it works with our partners. And that goes down to the accountability um, to really sort of actually echo what our CEO, Sarah Bentley, has been saying about putting the basics right, getting them right, improving our future, and really trying to make sure that actually we are sharing information correctly, transparently, and that um, we can work together in harmony with others. And all of that has taken quite a considerable amount of time. COVID aside, of course, that kind of set us back uh, a fair bit. But the decision making, the time it takes to, to kind of get everybody on board has to be sort of in a kind of a non-commercially minded approach. Um, the capacity building and the time is really critical because a lot of the partner organizations are doing things either pro bono. There are a lot of volunteers that they work with. And also their time is split between so many different funding opportunities. So we have to be flexible, but also recognizing that we have to deliver at the end of the year, the milestones that we are set to, to achieve. So we have to keep an iterative mind of how we progress things um, and really create that flexible environment of funding, or of achievement. Um, and if, if people aren't able to deliver what they have said they can, because of some circumstances, we look for other alternatives and there's no kind of blame game in this. It's just, just try and get it done as a team. So uh, one of the things that we're very much reliant on is, of course, the monitoring information. And here across the three different uh, catchments, uh, we have a lot of involvement with the citizen science, which are really, I suppose, the backbone of what we're trying to achieve. Um, there's only so much quality information you can get from a SOND or from other ways of monitoring. Um, and it's sense checking that uh, what's happening on the ground is genuinely what's, what's occurring. And we have in the even load, uh, we've got even some sort of um, uh, response cameras, which are on 24 hours a day, which can give us an indication of what's happening in the river, particularly in times of flood or drought um, and certain and also sort of how quickly things can move up and therefore sometimes give erroneous um, results on the, the monitoring equipment. But actually, we can sense check that with our citizen sampling as well and really critical for the outfall work that's happening in uh, in the crane um, and the urban catchments too. So last almost slide is um, just to show the different types of monitoring that we're looking into. This is only a smattering of what we've got. There's quite a lot going on. Um, and we definitely recognize the need for um, having either uh, the public involved in the water blitzes and understanding how sort of important it is to, to get this information and be involved. Clearly the water bathing, water, bathing water uh, and um, improvements that we want to see are part of this, but it's also really just to do the habitat surveys um, as well as many of the other um, just sense checkers of what's going on in the rivers themselves. Um, so this is all mapped with uh, Rosie and also some of the partners that we work with um, through the different uh, organizations and the institutions, the universities, um, and Kate's here with us today, so maybe able to chip in on some things that she's been specifically doing from Queen Mary. And we're very much reliant on all of this coming together to form our evidence base, uh, from which we have these 12 different multiple parameters that we want to check in on um, to see how well we're doing and really understanding from all the different elements of reducing our carbon footprint uh, to really raising the awareness and voice amongst uh, households and commercial entities on how they're utilizing their water um, and really understanding how we can pull in the information from our side uh, on seeing sort of what misconnections are happening, how much investment that is in sealing some of our manholes to prevent too much ingress. Um, so it's trying to put in all this information together to really give a clear idea of what's happening. I recognize I've zoomed through this a little bit, but if you do have any questions uh, after this presentation, after this meeting, uh, please feel free to email us at partnerships at thameswaters.co.uk. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, pretty much perfectly on time. So we've got a few, <laughs> uh, a few, question, uh, few uh, minutes for questions. Um, I don't see any in the chat at the moment. Um, anybody interested in asking questions, either um, put your hand up or um, 
put it into the chat. Um, in the meantime, I've got um, a couple of questions. We, I mean, I'm interested in the sort of citizen science component. Um, and I don't know whether you managed to go to the poster um, in the poster session by one of my PhD students, Tess. Um, and she's been looking at rainfall data from the WOW data set, the Met Office WOW data set. Um, and one of the issues we've come across is really this, this quality control. And you me me mentioned, um, you know, making sure these citizen science um, observations are robust. So I think this is, you know, how, how do you actually do that? Um, and the other thing I wondered was, um, is there any additional data that you think would be useful to have from citizens that you don't have at the moment, potentially? Uh, gosh, yes. Um, triangulation, I think, in terms of data quality is, is really critical. And, and I think we've got a pentagon or, or an octagon now because there's so many different areas that we're trying to cross-referencing information against. And I think that's what's really helpful in terms of the citizen science. And uh, none, none of the data is going to be 100% spot on. There are going to be anomalies. And it's really making sure that we can say, well, OK, we can cross-check this to the, to the minute if necessary. Um, to see sort of whether there's some erroneous data appearing or not, um, or whether that's a genuine spike for a genuine reason. And I think that's the beauty of having the citizen science is, is having eyes on the ground, literally, um, and be able to do sort of like cross-reference sampling of whatever parameter we feel is of greatest concern to us. Um, so whether it is from looking at uh, non-native invasive species to, to looking at sort of invertebrate sampling to all kinds of river fly monitoring, um, so to, to also sort of like our, our pee reduction and other things as well and ammonia. So, um, yeah, I think those are the, the ways that we're trying to make sure that we can get the most robust and honest type of information and credible um, that will help us. And then the second part of your question, what would be missing? Um, unification. <laughs> I think one of the things is that people collect things in different ways. There's so many different ways of collecting the same type of parameter um, mm. and making sure that the data is presented really clearly and kind of coming to a universal agreement at the start, which is what we're trying to do, to how we can make sure we're tracking the same thing and not think five years down the line, oh, we should have. Um, so that's the kind of the correlation and the, kind of the, the understanding we're trying to glean now. Um, and then also some of the softer metrics, it's really interesting sort of looking at um, community health, uh, blue health, you know, how can we try and get that kind of um, prescription monitoring sort of going on, sort of, you know, who's actually utilizing this for, for different benefits, it's much more recognized since COVID now, um, mm. and, you know, how can we do that too? Quick question in the chat for you then as well, um, before you finish, um, how were the stakeholders and partners identified and recruited? Good question. Uh, so we have our hosting organizations, which are the CABA hosting organizations, and they have feelers out through multiple different uh, avenues. So what we did at the start is basically did a, a launch saying we're doing this kind of initiative, who would be interested in taking part in sort of shaping it with us. Um, and then that produced, I think, about 80 or 100 people in one of the catchment areas. Um, and then from that, it's signing up or kind of answering some questions or coming back to us with some ideas on specific areas. So whether it's on water quality, wildlife corridors, working with people, say non-native invasive species, um, and looking at really sort of, you know, which areas they could contribute to, um, and then going from there and building and building that network. And I think what we're doing now is also collecting a stakeholder matrix and analysis across different groups, across different issues, um, and really kind of building that, which will be, you know, it's word of mouth a lot of the time. Um, it's making sure that we get to the right venues. Um, so it's from making sure we're present at different events so people can sign up and just know what's happening. So mm -hmm. it's, um, it's a building block uh, approach, but uh, yeah, trying to make sure we're going through the right avenues to start with at least.